Sunday uh, together and to get to be here on a Sunday to celebrate fathers. I, I know that this has probably been said many times, but as we look around the room this morning, I am sure that, that many of us can look back to our father and say who our father was and the godly example that he was in our family is a big part of why I chose my own faith and why I'm here this morning. Whether it, it was the sacrifice that he would make uh, to, to say, you know what, I'm giving up um, my personal desires to, to be there on a Sunday morning or to, to make sure my family was always there or to, to give up personal time to serve in the kingdom. For many of us, our Father's example is why we have, have gotten to be here this morning. Uh, I do want to acknowledge, and it was acknowledged in the prayer as well earlier, but for some of us today, this might be a painful day. Maybe you look back in your past and uh, who your father was, he just wasn't good to you. Um, and I, I want to acknowledge how that can be something that is painful. And, and I want to say this as well. As we get into our lesson today, we're going to reference the relationship between a father and child quite a bit. And I want to acknowledge that, uh, that, that, is, that if you were somebody who grew up with a uh, father who maybe didn't treat you right, that could be a tough discussion. But I want us to think about this in a beautiful father-child relationship. I also know that, that several of you, uh, I would say a, a large number of those in, in the congregation this morning have, have lost their father. And a day today is, is a difficult one because this would have been a day that you would have, have called your father and wished him a happy Father's Day. And for, for many in this room, that won't be uh, something you are going to have the opportunity to do today. And so that can be painful. Together today, though, we get to be here celebrating uh, the ultimate father, the one who has, has given us life, one who is, is far greater than any earthly father we can imagine. Uh, and and throughout, the op throughout the lesson today, we're going to have the opportunity to examine how truly great our heavenly father is, which I feel like is a very, like, Father's Day thing to do, right, is to, to look at the, the ultimate father on Father's Day. But I'm excited to get into that, so let's get started this morning. This week we're going to remain in the Names of God series that Kyle has been preaching through. And I've really enjoyed getting to look at several of the different names of God that, that Kyle has walked through. And, and how those different names of God are things that, that provide for us differently in our life. And whether it be uh, God provider or God healer or whatever it might have been that we have studied so far. But I think that the, the father word that we're going to study today is possibly a little bit different than the ones that Kyle has been walking through. Because the word we're looking at today is not one that is in Hebrew or Greek, but it is an Arabic word that is Abba. And as we walk through this, I hope that what we can do as we can take this, this pretty, I think probably a pretty common word that we use, although it's only used three times in Scripture, we can take this, this word Abba and, and, and allow ourselves to realize how present Abba Father is in our lives today. But if I were to start out this morning by simply saying, all right, here is the definition of Abba Father, I think that we would maybe miss the entire beauty of who Abba Father is. And so instead of just simply throwing a definition of Abba Father on the screen to begin and, and going through ideas, you and I together today are going to embark on a journey that will eventually lead us to a place of discovery of Abba Father and how you and I fit into the equation of who Abba Father is. And to do this, we must start to define the relationship. So if you want to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 3 is where we're going to begin uh, this morning. And, uh, and Brian just read for us the John account of what we see in Matthew chapter 3, which is the baptism of Jesus. And as we go through this, what we're going to do, just to, to lay out some groundwork real quickly, so you can kind of know the direction where we're going, we are going to begin by looking how the Father addresses the Son, then we're going to go how the Son addresses the Father, and then how those two work together in a beautiful thing that, that we can parallel for ourselves. And so, here we go, starting in, in Matthew chapter 3, let's get started, starting in verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, 
and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill the righteousness. Then he consented. I I love this. Jesus walks up to to John the Baptist, and and as he approaches John the Baptist, they are baptizing uh, baptizing people. You can imagine the eyes of John the Baptist just becoming saucers. You know, they're huge eyes, and he can sit there and say, Whoa, here's the guy who I've been telling you about. And and Jesus says, It's time for me to be baptized. And you can just imagine John sitting there saying, No, 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 no. This is not what we're doing here. This is, this is not the plan. Look, you're Jesus. I've been telling all these people that the reason that they should even repent of their sins and go into this water is because you're coming and you're going to baptize with something far greater than I am. And Jesus says, no, John, it's okay. This is so righteousness can be fulfilled. And I love how the simple word of Jesus, John says, I mean, if you say it, we will do this. And Jesus allows himself to be baptized. John consents. And then we get to verse 16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. Now I need us to allow this to set in this morning. Jesus goes into the waters of baptism. He is placed under the water. And when he comes out of the water, the heavens open, and we see the Spirit of God. And like if we were to really do a deep dive, this is the same Spirit of God that we see all throughout Scripture. This is an incredible study if you ever have time. But as like this isn't just like some vision that's happening. This isn't some artificial thing. As Brian just read in John chapter 1, verse 32, it indicates John the Baptist bore witness to this. He physically saw it. This is, this is happening. And he's going to see the dove and he's going to hear the voice. And, and so you see this, this dove descending on Jesus. And like I said before, if we had time this morning, we would absolutely... I would love to get into it, but you very quickly begin to see this parallel taking place where you have the Spirit of God descending on Jesus after he comes out of the waters of baptism, and you very, this is is a pretty uh, easy to understand concept, you see the exact parallel to the Christian today as we come out of the waters of baptism and the Spirit of God is descending on us. There's a beautiful parallel that, that I want us to keep in the back of our minds because we're going to come back to that concept later. Um, and so, so keep that idea of, of the freshly baptized Christian has the Spirit descend on them in the same way the Spirit descended on Jesus in that moment. We continue in verse 17. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. I love this. We see God the Father send God the Spirit to God the Son in this moment. And I love how here we see the Holy Trinity of God, all three persons, all visible, separate but unified. And and it's kind of like that moment when your brain can just begin to explode at, at what is taking place here and who God is in this moment. And we hear God the Father make the statement, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We, we should not miss this. God the Father loves the Son and communicated his love to him by sending God the Holy Spirit. And, and I want us, this is, this is vital to us understanding Abba Father. So this is, this is why we're going through this this morning. I want us to almost imagine the connection that the Father and the Son are having in this moment. It's almost like a father in this moment is bending down and, and, and wrapping his arms around a child and saying the phrase, I love you. I'm so proud of who you are. And we can imagine this because we can imagine a young child running into the arms of a father and a father wrapping that child up in a hug that is is so loving and so gentle and so kind. And the tone of the father to the son in this moment exemplifies, and it's crazy that we see it in the moment of the Trinity, it exemplifies this father-child relationship in this moment. 
For God the Father looks at Jesus and says, this is my beloved son. Then we get to, if you want to jump over to Mark chapter 14, we'll be there in just a moment. We see that God the Father references God the Son in a loving, fatherly way. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And then we get to Mark chapter 14, and we're going to see Jesus is going to reference the Father in this moment. Uh, Here's the thing. We're going to get to that exact passage in just a moment. Jesus, through all the New Testament is going to refer to God as Father. We'll see him reference God every once in a while when he's teaching, but generally when they're having these moments of personal interaction and personal discussion, you're going to see Jesus reference God as Father, and he's going to talk to him as Father. And really, it's the first time in Scripture that we see an individual talking to God as Father. Kyle has talked a lot about it. The name of God was so holy that they were afraid to say it. And they were, they were nervous to speak it. But here we have Jesus who's speaking to God in, a, in really a, almost a very formal sense for the first time uh, that, that we see this moment. And in, in Mark chapter 14, where we are going to be, uh, we are going to see Jesus address God the Father in a way that we only see God the Father addressed one time. And it's by Jesus in this moment. And it's this very personal addressing. And and he's going to say this word in Arabic, which we don't get translated from the Greek. And it's almost like Jesus is going to use this word very intentionally. It's not something that's just thrown out there. I already mentioned this word's only used three times. It, 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 It is something that he's going to mention very intentionally, almost to symbolize the importance of the relationship and the type of relationship that we can see God the Father and God the Son having. And in Mark 14, he's in the Garden of Gethsemane in his moment of stress before going to the cross. And look at what he says in his prayer here. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Jesus looks at God the Father. And it's almost like he is coming to God the Father with tears in his eyes. And he's in this moment of, of dire need and distress. And in the same way that we can imagine a father crouching down and giving a child a hug and saying, I love you, I am so pleased with who you are. You can almost imagine a child running up to a father and, and throwing their arms around his leg with tears in their eyes. Almost in a moment of desperation, like they don't know what to do. Maybe it's a moment in their life where, where they know they need to take a step to, to be the brave kid. Or they, they need to take a step to grow and learn and mature. But they really, really don't want to go through that. And you can feel the sadness of Jesus as he approaches God the Father. And he says, Abba, Father, please, if it is your will, don't let me go through this. But if it is... I'll I'll be okay with it. And in this moment, Jesus approaches the Father as a child approaches their Father. And I am sure that many in the room probably understand the meaning of Abba. But in in Arabic, the word Abba is the phrase that that would be a, a word that a child would use for their father. So this, this would be, like in our world today, it would be, it would be like a phrase like, like daddy or papa. Like something that, that a, 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 young, a young child, one that hasn't grown up, one that is still at, at a place where they're, where they're struggling to, to maybe get full syllables out or struggling to comprehend things on the next level because they're so young. It is this idea of saying, I am giving everything to you in this moment. This isn't, this Abba Father is not a casual, hey dad, what's going on today? Hey dad, how was your day at work? Hey dad, it is, it is good to talk to you. Hey, it's good to share a meal with you, Father. It's good to talk with you. Hey, hey dad, you know, you want to give me a call sometime? Or, or maybe in our world, 
you know, a daily call with our parents or something like that. It's not that type of relationship. This word Abba is literally a child in need, a child who cannot provide for themselves. And Jesus in this moment is referencing the Father as Abba. And he's the only one who is referencing the Father as Abba. Like I said, he was the only one. What's interesting is no one else in Scripture up to this point had referenced the Father like this because this was a personal, exclusive name for the child of the Father. It was a personal, exclusive name for the child of the Father. And so, as we are are kind of building this imagery of the relationship between the Father and Son this morning as we kind of get to a place where we combine it with ourselves, uh, we see that Father God looks at Jesus and says, you are my beloved child. You are my beloved son. I love you like this. And we see that that father-child relationship, and we see that Jesus looks at God, the Father, and says, Abba, Father, like a child who is in need. And it's great. I mean, if you didn't know that, now you do. If you did know it, you've, your brain has been refreshed. Um, and, and so you're in a place, now we, we can understand this, we can see this. But I love how Scripture doesn't stop there. I love how Scripture doesn't just leave us at this and we say that's a cool relationship they have between each other. But instead, we can realize how this daily impacts us. So let's jump over to Galatians. In Galatians chapter 3 and 4, and really the entire book of Galatians, we're going to stumble across Paul in the midst of a letter. And Paul is going to be writing this letter. He, he had spent some time with the Galatians, and he had, had trained them, and they were an active church there in Galatia, and they were doing a lot of really good things in Galatia. And then suddenly, out of nowhere, you had some Jewish Christians, and they rolled into town, and they said, hey, we need to be a part of the church. Here's the church of Galatia. And they say, ah, we see this, but here's the thing. You're not doing a lot of things that we Jews used to do. And by the way, you're going to have to do these things. They start to cast all these laws on the church of Galatia. And and Paul hears about this from afar. And he says, oh no, I've got to write a letter. I've got to tell them that no, 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 this is not the case. You can live in Jesus and not have to follow the laws of the Jews. And now there's simply faith in Christ. Look at what it says in, in Galatians 3 verse 23. I, I also have to turn to Galatians 3, verse 23. Here we go, in Galatians 3, verse 23. It says, now before faith came, before faith came, that's referencing a faith in Jesus, we were held captive under the law. So he's talking about God followers. So before we had Jesus come, those who wanted to follow God were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then... The law was our guardian. Remember that word guardian, because he's going to use it again in just a moment. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. Paul stops them in their tracks. And he says, look, I understand that you're wanting to cast these laws among the people. I understand all these things, but here's the deal, Jewish Christians— The law that you are trying to throw on people was abolished when the faith of Jesus came to be what justifies us. Now, here's here's the deal. This is a crazy change for Paul from his life. And, And the reason I want us to kind of walk through how big of a deal change this is for Paul is because he goes from like one extreme over here all the way to the other extreme over here, right? He's making a a, a huge change in his life, and I think it can be an encouragement for us as we look to make changes in our life as well. But I I want to to realize that we have a heavily educated Jewish rabbi who understands all of what the law is. He understands all the laws uh, that that were in the Torah, the, the original law of God, right? He lives by them. This is what his entire life was based on. He studied his entire life for these things, and now he is sitting here writing down words that are saying, hey, that law, that, that, that law that you're trying to put on other people, that law of the past that, that you want to live by, yeah, that, that law is totally obsolete. And, and I, I want to paint almost like 
a really silly illustration just for us to, I, I, I still don't think we can grasp the ultimate change that we see Paul go through here, but none of what I'm about to say is true, so please hear that. But I want you to, 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 walk, to walk with me down this, this path of imagery, okay? Let's say next week we've decided Buford Church of Christ, we have a new doctrine. And this doctrine says that we will no longer meet in a building, and so we sell this building here. We sell it immediately. We offer it at a great price. It's bought wonderfully quickly. And so we, we have uh, some lucrative cash flow, and we say, okay, here's the deal. For church next week, what we're doing is we are going to go meet in the woods out somewhere in the middle of the country, and we're, here's, here's the deal for church next week. We are all going to wear deerskin clothing, and it's going to be wild. I don't know where we're getting all the deerskin clothing, but we just sold the building, so that's where we're getting it. And then we're also going to take these jars of honey, and we take these jars of honey, and, and what we're going to do for church next week is we're going to go meet in the woods, and we're going to take our jars of honey and wear a deerskin, and we're going to start chanting in the woods. If I were to say that today, you'd be like, oh, that's a big change, right? And we would say, yes, that, it, once again, we're not doing that. I want to make that very clear. But, but that would be a huge change for us as the Buford Church of Christ, right? To go into the woods and chant and eat honey and wear deerskin. Well, here's, here's what, what they're dealing with here is imagine there's another church down the road and they say, oh, that doctrine is correct. We also need to, to eat honey and wear deerskin and meet in the woods and chant. And, and so they meet us out there and they're loving it. And then they, they, we get to the end of our time of meeting in the woods wearing our deerskin and eating our honey. And they say, wait, you haven't taken the Lord's Supper. What are we doing here? And we say, no, 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 that, that's in the past. They say, no, 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 no. Under this new doctrine, we also have to take, uh, take the Lord's Supper. And we're sitting there. And this is, this is the situation here. It's this big, drastic change, and, and there's other people from the past trying to come in and, and, and enact the past law on people. And so here we see Paul. Like, this is the, this is the level of change that's taken place in his life. And, and once again, this is all getting us to why Abba Father matters to us. We see here, and we say, okay, Paul, what is the deal? He has totally made a transition from a life that is filled with this law to totally understanding all of that is obsolete. All of it is past, and we're all in on Jesus Christ and who he is and how he has changed our life because of the beauty of what the call is. Because what we're going to see here is that there's a shift that goes from a, a, that goes from a law relationship to a child and father relationship. Look how this is illustrated, continuing on in verse 25. We see, but now that faith has come, remember we called the law our guardian before, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. Now we see the phrase here, guardian. And when we think about guardian, that can often refer to uh, a parent, but also... It can refer to somebody who is not a parent. It can refer to somebody who is signing documents, the one who is in charge of that child in that moment, but not, it's not always a, ch uh, a child-parent relationship. It is just making sure that child has what they need in order to get to the next step, to get to the next place if they don't have a parent. parent. And so what we see is Paul saying, look, there was a law, it was a guardian, it was a good thing. It watched over us, it, it, it kept us safe, it, it, was, it was there, it was for us to follow, but it's going to be replaced by a parent in verse 26. Look at this, it says, For in Christ Jesus you are all sons of God through faith. See, what he does is he hits this big transition. And there's not just a transition from the law to, to Jesus. There's a transition that says you're going from a guardian to a child of God. And how does it happen? Verse 27 says when you're baptized into Christ and put on Christ, that's when you become a child of God. So for those of us who are sitting in this room this morning who are baptized into Christ Jesus, we are not under a guardian of God. We are actual children of God. We are a direct, immediate family connection. I, I want the tight-knit nature of this to set in for just a minute. 
There's a massive connection that is this relationship identified in Galatians 3 is calling our relationship with God a healthy, immediate family connection. It's not some distant connection. It's not like, like an out there connection. It is a direct, immediate family connection that we get to share in with Jesus Christ. And I want this to sink in this, this morning. Because what I fear is that there are often times that, that we as Christians, and, and maybe you catch yourself doing this, I catch myself doing this all the time, but we still sometimes like to treat God like a guardian. And we say, God, you can watch over us, but at an arm's length, we'll give you reign over our life here and here and here. But in these areas, I'm still serving myself. And instead of allowing ourselves to be in an immediate family connection with our father, we find ourselves still kind of remaining in a place where he is simply just our guardian. I want us to bump up a few verses to chapter 4. Look at what it says in verse 4 and 5. And this is, this is a really dense passage, so we're going to read it a few times here in just a minute. It says, starting in verse 4, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And I love this. Because what Paul does here is he assumes, in the broadest sense, the entire storyline of the entire gospel message. He says, okay, Jesus is born into the people who agreed to the terms of the law, who agreed to the terms of the Torah at Sinai. These are people who were of the lineage of Abraham. But as Craig mentioned on Sunday night, those people were not able to keep up the law. If, if you... Uh, if you weren't here Sunday night, you should definitely go check that out. It, it was an awesome lesson. But those individuals were not able to keep up the law. And so what must take place is the Savior is going to have to enter this equation. By the way, not just randomly, but through the family, the lineage of Abraham, so that the promise of redemption to the world will be fulfilled. And once again, I want to just throw this in there. God doesn't break his promises, so of course that had to be through the lineage of Abraham. And I want to read these verses again, because I, I, I think that with that in mind, these two verses, uh, when I kind of studied it and went back and reread it, I was like, whoa, that's really intense this time. Verse 4 again. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. We get to share in the story of God's people, and it unites us to the story that stretches all the way back to the very beginning. And what's the entire point of what is taking place? It's so that our guardian can shift from being the law to God the Father because you and I have been adopted as his children, where he is giving us everything and he is providing everything to us every single day. It's such a, a gorgeous two-layer message because in one sense you have this moment where he's sitting here and saying, okay, what you have is you have us getting adopted in to the people of Abraham. We are adopted into that promised lineage that he promised way back when, when we are no longer in that law, but we are now a part of the promised lineage. But also, and this is the one that, that I, I can't help but, but get emotional with it every time, is because we have actually become sons and daughters to the living God. It's not some metaphor. It's not some random thing where it's like, oh no, we're the children of God who meet here together, you know, we're, we're the people. But literally, actual children of God. This is the consistent message throughout Scripture to us. And this is where verse 6 hits us, and I want us to, to see this together. And because you are sons, because we are children of God, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, 
Father. We have become his children because the spirit of his son has entered the equation in our lives. And when the spirit of his son is in our lives, we suddenly have the opportunity to cry out every single day, Abba, Father. And you and I get to join in using that exclusive personal word that is the word that Jesus used that is only meant for the father-child relationship. And what we have to understand is that as we sit here and say, Abba, Father, he is doing the same thing and he's looking at us and wrapping his arms around us and saying, you are my beloved child with whom I am well pleased. And according to Galatians chapter 4, verse 6, that's unified by his spirit. Do we feel the parallel to the baptism of Jesus that takes place in our lives today? See, when we make the decision, when we make the dedication to be a child of God, we are to be a people who look in a, at God in a way that is suddenly saying, Abba, Father. Looking at him in a way that's saying, God, you are provider. God, you are healer. God, I can't give myself anything. You are my ultimate provider. Therefore, God, you make every decision in my life. And by the way, the one who's done that is the one who, according to uh, this passage earlier, in chapter 3, verse 27, is the one who's been baptized into Christ. And so, for a vast majority of us, we should be sitting here making the statement, you're my provider, I can't give anything to myself, you make all the decisions in my life. I was talking to somebody about this the other day. Uh, do you remember when you were becoming independent in life? Just like taking that step from being like in your parents' household to not being in your parents' household. For me, this was like five, six years ago, I, I think, something like that. So it was very recent. I remember it pretty well. For others of you, you might be sitting there saying, that was a long time ago. I don't remember that at all. But maybe you remember your children becoming independent from you, and some of you have not yet become independent. So you have no relation to this whatsoever. But um, for me... <laughs> For me, when I was trying to become independent, I had just left college, and I had gotten my first job. I was about to, to get married, and I remember uh, I, I just always wanted to be independent from my father. Now, this was not because I had a bad relationship with my father. My father and I have a great relationship. We talk on the phone almost every day. When I was in college, we talked almost every day, and when I was in high school, like, he was the one who would take me to school in the mornings. And so we would sit there and we would talk and enjoy our conversations every single day. And so my father and I have a, had, a, had and have a great relationship. But I was sitting there in a place in life where I was saying, I really want to be independent from my father. Because to me, as long as there was something in life that was being financially taken care of by my dad, he had authority to tell me what to do. Like, if, if he was in a spot where he was covering my housing, well, why should he not be able to tell me what I need to do? If he was covering my phone plan, why should he not get to tell me what to do? After all, he is providing for me. If he's, if he's providing food for me, well, I should respect my father, and I should give him a, a point in the decision-making process. I felt this awful thing that was just weighing over me, where it was like, if anything I wanted to do that was like, enjoyable. I don't, I don't know. Like I, I, my dad could be like, no, you can't do that because look, I'm paying for this in your life. If you can afford to go to a concert, why shouldn't you be able to afford to buy yourself food? And he had a point. So it was one of these situations where it was like, I felt this, this desperate need to sit there and say, okay, the second I am an adult male at 21 years old, I am going to get a full-time job, and I am going to become independent from my father so I could call the shots in my life. Not that I don't call dad and ask for advice, but I wanted to be able to be the final decision maker. I wanted to get past this point of looking to my dad and saying, I rely on you for everything in my life. Here's the deal. If you and I believe and accept the words in Galatians chapter 4, which, as I've said, this is the third time, is the one who's made the decision to be baptized into Christ, then I have made the decision 
to look at my God and say, Abba, Father. Which is a statement that I can make when I have decided to totally rely on the Father. And allow him to be the key decision maker in every aspect of my life. And yet, as we have almost mentioned already, he sits there, we sit here as individuals who want to reference him as dad and want to give him, want to give him just a little bit of authority in our lives. Hey, I'll call you for advice. I'll spend some time with you each week. Hey, I'll, I'll, I'll eat with you each week. I'll, I'll call you on a daily basis. I'll listen to words that you have to say with me on a daily basis. But when it comes to the decision, the final say, I get to make it in my life. Because I am myself, and I'm an adult, and you're an adult, and we have the ability to make adult decisions individually. And we still look at him like that, instead of looking at him as Abba Father the one who has adopted us to be his child. We are to be people who, who cry Abba, who cry Papa, who cry Daddy, when, when we're when in every aspect of life, not just when we're in a difficult spot. And so today, on this Father's Day, I want to ask the question, when you look to your father, what do you call him today? Are you going to cry, Abba? Are you going to allow him to be your provider, your comfort, your strength, your commander, your healer, the person you call when you need anything, the person you call when it's time to celebrate? Are you going to allow him to bend down like he did with Jesus and like he has invited me to do and allow him to bend down and take me in his arms and say, you are my beloved son. You are my beloved child in whom I am well pleased. This morning, if you have not yet made the decision to allow yourself, we've talked about baptism a lot, if you have not yet made the decision to be baptized into Christ, to allow yourself to be to a place where you're crying, Abba, Father, we want to invite you to that decision this morning, to put him on a baptism and to allow yourself to be at a place where you can say, Abba, Father. And if you have put him on in Christ. But you look at your life and you say, whoa, the last thing I'm doing is letting him be my provider and my all. He would love to allow you to start choosing him as that father this morning. If there's anything we can do for you, please come this morning as we stand and as we